Let's go to Genesis 19. We'll start there. And I'm going to show you, we're going to, I'm going to show you some things that I, I started this series a few weeks ago. Um, and it's, uh, it's called The Mystery of the Mysteries. And <clears throat> what it's actually about is uh, the idea that I had of showing that the secret societies like masonry, I noticed that Delphi has one of their old buildings is an old Odd Fellows Lodge meeting. International Order of Odd Fellows. You can see the I O O F up on the building there. It's on Main Street. And some people don't know what Odd Fellows are, but they were like a break off of Freemasonry. And in a town where you have Odd Fellows, you don't have Freemasons. In a town where you have Freemasons, you don't have Odd Fellows because they did not get along. Okay? So, anyway, I noticed that there was one in town. Uh, there's another town that I've seen. Do what? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So anyway, it was the idea that I was going to show you that what every secret society in the world, Odd Fellows, Masonry, Rosicrucianism, uh, the mysteries of the Catholic Church, uh, you name it, all of the old, everything that Manly Hall wrote about in Secret Teachings of All Ages had everything in the world to do with Matthew 24 when the stars of the heavens fall to the earth. It had everything to do with it. So what I kind of did, I was going to do something different. I was thinking about it all day today and I was going to kind of do that. But when I got, when I got to, the, to, the, uh, to the campsite and I'm looking at that presentation, I thought, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do that tonight. Now, some of the notes were hurriedly put together. So I don't know if some of this is going to make sense, but I'm going to try to do my best with it. Uh, you got your Bible open to Genesis chapter 19. And I want you to look at, oh, let's see here, verse 15. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. While he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and laid and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and said, without the city, it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plains, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. This is where Lot gets into it with the angel and says, Lot said unto them, oh, not, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and which has magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Well, that's where he ended up anyway. He ended up in the mountain. And behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. It is, is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee, and, and you know what? Let me just let me just add something here. Just a side note. Indianapolis, Indiana is nothing like Delphi, Indiana. Sodom was a big city and there was a lot of sin there. And I've been to Delphi now every year since you guys have had me out here, and I would live in that town. It's a small city. They seem to have somewhat decent values for these two girls to come up missing, and the whole town rallies around these two girls. How, when has that ever happened in Delphi, Indiana? Never. 
But stuff like that happens in the big cities every week. Okay? And Lot's right. Fleeing the big city of Sodom and going to a little city of Zohar to him was a lot better, more, more, more moral place to live than Sodom was. I would rather live in Hillsboro, Missouri or Delphi, Indiana than I would St. Louis, Missouri or Indianapolis, Indiana. Amen? Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I'm, I'm just saying that's, you can tell a difference. The small towns, they like their towns being small and they like their lifestyle, their way, and they don't want a bunch of big companies moving in and changing everything, do they? These people who own these farms out here, they don't want to sell their farms to a bunch of factories and a bunch of, uh, Construction guys are going to go to throw up a bunch of apartments and a bunch of houses everywhere. Y'all don't want that, do you? You want to keep them corn fields and soybean fields and things like that. So anyway, he said, um, verse 22, Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Verse 23, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar, and then the Lord reigned. What did he do? He reigned. And what did he reign upon Sodom and Gomorrah? Brimstone and what? Fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now, we know, we know from Jeremiah that Sodom and Gomorrah is a foreshadowing of what God is going to do to Babylon. He's going to rain fire down upon Babylon. And Babylon is going to be as Sodom and Gomorrah. We also know, if you turn to Genesis 29... Genesis 29, that, uh, no, excuse me, Deuteronomy 29, I'm sorry, I told you the wrong place. If you turn to Deuteronomy 29, you're going to find God making a promise to the Jews. He starts it in chapter 28 saying, if you keep all my commandments and my statutes and judgments, then I'll bless everything you've got. But if you turn away from it, he gives them a whole list of things in Deuteronomy 28 that he's going to do. And then in chapter 29, he promises them, let's see, where is it? Verse 23, that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning, that it is not sown nor beareth nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboam, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. How many cities did he overthrow here? And what did we learn about that last night? That number is always a picture of the, of the spiritual realm. Always. Whether it's the gospel, the true gospel, the false gospel, or the spiritual realm, it's always a picture of that. That's why God mentions four cities here. He's going to destroy it. And, and now, and I'm setting you all up for this. Okay. Um, what else did God do with fire? Um, who was able to bring fire from heaven, from God down and consume a very wet sacrifice? Elijah. And were the prophets of Baal able to do that? No. And God sent fire down from heaven in order to be able to do that. Okay? Now, here's why I'm showing you all this. Let me back up a second. This is what something that I was going to put on the screen last night and I forgot to do it. Psalm 104 verse 4 says, 
who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Now, before I go to the next verse, and if you're writing notes down, I'm going to give you my four lessons that God taught me on how to understand and read and interpret the Bible. Very simple principles. If you'll write them down and use these principles, you'll be able to understand things that all of the scholars in the world could never, never figure out. Okay? The first one was that you have to believe that this Bible, this King James Bible, was translated by God himself and gave that translation to the men who worked on translating this book and that this book speaks as one whole complete Tracy, you were telling us about a Bible that you had. It didn't have any chapter and verse divisions in it. All it had was chapters of chapter one was Genesis, chapter two was Exodus, chapter three was Leviticus, chapter four was Numbers, chapter five was Deuteronomy. And it was written like somebody had written a storybook and it was laid out that way so as she's reading the Bible she's reading a storybook written by like one author think about it even though there's like 40 men who helped write this Bible who was the author of the Bible and finisher, and finisher Jesus Christ so think of Jesus Christ as the one author of the entire Bible. So that if you see a stone in the book of Genesis, you can take and follow that stone all through the scripture because that stone is going to mean the same thing all through the scriptures the stone is going to be the stone cut out without hands the stone is going to be the stone that the builders rejected the stone is going to be the stone that sunk into goliath's forehead the stone is going to be who jesus christ the chief corner stone and it's, and it's like when you see a stone way back here in the Old Testament, if you'll read through the whole Bible and study just the word stone with this understanding that a stone, just a regular stone, means Jesus Christ, God will open up ideas to you that you never had before, ever. The second thing that I learned was that numbers mean something. Learn those numbers and what they mean because God doesn't just throw them in there willy-nilly. Why do we have to know that when David reached down to pick up stones to kill Goliath, why does the Bible have to tell us that he picked up exactly five of them? See, it doesn't go along with the story, but it does go along with a prophetic theme that's related to the number five. And God is telling you that this story is related to this number right here and what it means. So learn the numbers. Number three learn typology Bible typology I cannot express to you how important Bible typology is 
And I'll give you some easy clues, easy ways to learn typology. Every man in the Bible is either going to be a picture of Jesus Christ or a picture of the other Jesus, the Antichrist. So if I say David, who's he? Christ. If I say Goliath, Antichrist. And, and see, watch how this makes sense now. How tall was he? Six cubits. Um, how many fingers did his brother have? Six. Um, David said, thy servant, meaning David, hath killed both a lion and a bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as them. And in Revelation 13, the description of the beast is that he is a lion and a bear. Isn't it cool? And where did he get hit at? Right where the mark of the beast goes. Mm, mm, mm. And see, in Revelation 13, when John sees this beast rise up out of the sea, he has a deadly wound in one of his heads, doesn't he? See how important typology is? You just associated Goliath with the beast. And you'll never forget it. Women are either going to be a type of heavenly Jerusalem or mystery Babylon. So if I give you a name, Sarah. Is she heavenly Jerusalem or mystery Babylon? Sarah, because she is the mother of the saints. She's the mother of the tribes of Israel. The mother of the child of promise. So if I give you another name, Herodias. You know who she was? The wife of Herod who sent her daughter, teenage daughter, out to do a booty dance in front of Herod. And then Herod said, Honey, whatever you want, I'll give you to the half of your kingdom. And see, the sickening part about that is, is that I personally don't think that that's all that Herodias' daughter did with King Herod. Because he wouldn't just give his half of his kingdom away just for a dance. He wanted all of it. Okay? So who is she? She's Mystery Babylon the Great. Okay? Who is Jezebel? Mystery Babylon the Great. Who's Delilah? Mystery Babylon the Great. Okay? So you can, take, you can pick any woman in the Bible and put her in one category or another, okay? Learn typology. Learn that every story in the Bible has a prophetic purpose. And then the prophets, Isaiah, Enoch, Elijah, Moses, David, they all spoke twice. The Bible says God speaketh once, yea, twice, in a dream and a vision. Then in the book of Psalms, David said, uh, God has spoken. Twice have I heard this. So we have two witnesses that say God speaks once, yea, twice. So if you're reading, let's, uh, let's, go, to, um, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 2. And I'll show you, I'll show you how this works. That every prophet in the Bible, there is always a partial fulfillment and a perfect last day's fulfillment. And I'll show it to you in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, P 
Peter is preaching the first sermon. The Holy Ghost has come upon them. And he's preaching out of the prophet Joel. He's preaching out of Joel chapter 2, right? And I want you to notice that it says, um, verse 19, And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord shall come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, he preached already before this how the Spirit was going to be poured out. Now, the, did that part happen on the day of Pentecost? Yes. But where was the blood, the fire, the vapor of smoke, the sun being darkened, the moon turning to blood, the stars of heaven falling? Where, where do you see that happening on the day of Pentecost? It didn't happen, did it? So does that mean that God lied? God doesn't lie. Does it mean that it was simply a metaphor for something that maybe have happened and it's up to us to figure out that maybe symbolically the sun meant something else and it was darkened and maybe symbolically the moon was turned to blood. Does it mean that? No. What does it mean? It means that part of this prophecy of Joel has not been fulfilled yet. But it's going to be. And if you will remember those four things. What was the first one? Huh? One author. And the words, follow the words all through the scriptures. Every word. Number two, what was the second one? Numbers. Learn the numbers. Number three, typology. Learn typology. Number four, the prophets speak twice. That even the prophet of Rachel weeping for her children, there's more to that prophecy that has not happened yet. Okay? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there's more to that prophecy that hasn't happened yet. Yet, what did Elisha ask Elijah for? Double portion. And Elisha is Israel who gets a double portion of the Holy Spirit after we who are Elijah are carried up into heaven in chariots. Wow. Now I said all that to say this. Notice in your Bible. God didn't just say, who maketh his angel spirits, his ministers, fire. He said he made his ministers a flaming fire. Why did he do that? Because he did it for a reason. Because Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, that God in flaming fire will take vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? First of all, if God is going to take flaming fire vengeance upon the people of the earth who know not God, what is it that's made out of flaming fire? Angels. Come. Come in, my man. How you doing? Ladies and gentlemen, John Robinson. How you doing, buddy? I've been waiting all week for you to show up, man. My buddy John's in the house all the way from Chicago. I love you, man. And you just missed the best part of the whole night. It took me 30 minutes to get to the first PowerPoint page. Okay? So, what does this mean? 
When God takes vengeance on the earth with flaming fire, what's he going to send down? Angels. Because they're the one, they're not just made of fire, they're made of flaming fire. Okay? Does that make sense to you now? So when God takes these angels, a third of them, who are made of flaming fire, and he kicks them out of heaven, is that God taking vengeance on this earth and those who believe not God? That's exactly what it is. But what about us who believe in God? Are they going to affect us in any way? No, we've got a shield of faith that keeps us from all the what kind of darts? Fiery darts. We don't have to worry about them because we'll have a shield of faith and a breastplate of righteousness and a helmet of salvation and they won't be able. And what, what, what was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in? Flaming fire. And when Jesus was with them, did they get, even get touched or singed by the smoke or the flame or the fire? Nothing. You see, all of these... All of these pictures work together to show us this one great, big, gigantic, the biggest, I've been saying it now for the last, since I've been making this set of videos on the mystery of the mysteries, the single most important event to take place on planet Earth besides the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ is when God kicks these angels out of heaven and he lets them out of the bottomless pit. Okay? The most important. And even Manly Hall knew it. Even Albert Pike knew it. Even John Mackey, who was a, uh, uh, a Masonic writer, even he knew it. They all knew that the day that heaven joined with earth was going to be the single most important day ever. Now, Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. How many of them? A third of them. Not all of them. A third of them. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And that goes with Revelation chapter 6. Because the heavens are going to be shaken. Like a uh, fig tree shaken when she is shaken of, an uh, of, a, of a mighty wind. What did they hear on the day of Pentecost? A mighty wind. Do you see how those two words are connected now? It's as if this book was written by one single author who wanted you to tie those two words together. Because he did. Shall, shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And everybody's going to say, uh-oh. And shall, that's not written in the text. And shall send his angels with the great sound of a... What are we waiting to hear? A trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven and to the other. And then 1 Corinthians 15 says it like this. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So... Again, if there's one thing I could tell all of God's church is learn to start letting go of this body. Let it go. Because God's going to remove you from it one of these days. Let him have it. Because what's it going to do for you when you lose this body? Are you not going to be better after that? Then let him have it. 
Quit being afraid of death. Quit being afraid of how many people you think are in the Illuminati that are trying to kill everybody on the earth. Quit worrying about that. I'll be honest with you. I personally do know that there are some people who believe in a who are part of a world depopulation program. I do know some, I actually know a person who is in on that. But I personally don't believe that that's how everything's going to happen. But just for the sake of the argument, let's say that there really is a great big gigantic conspiracy that's going to kill off six and a half billion people from this world. I say, I'll go first. Let me go. I want out of this world. I mean, I love my family. I love my wife. I want them to go with me, by the way. So if they're going to kill six and a half a billion, I'm pretty sure they're going to take my wife and all my family with me on the same day. If they're going to kill most of us, they're going to kill all of us in this room anyway, right? So why don't we just all go on the same day and let them have these bodies? Because when we come back in Revelation 19, it's not going to go well for them, is it? Mm -mm, Not at the Battle of Armageddon, it's not. We sh- I show you a mystery. Notice this word mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So he, Paul mentions that this is part of a mystery. Now. Here's Manly Hall, who wrote The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And I've explained it like this before, but I'll say it again just in case you don't know this. Manly Hall was a scholar of the occult. Some rich family noticed that he was studying all this occult material, gave him an unlimited amount of money to go and buy every type of occult document, uh, book, manifesto, you name it. And there's still a Manly P. Hall library in California that's maintained by this same family's trust. And there is a library in there and you can go there and read practically every book that Manly Hall collected. And he read all of these books and what he noticed was that at, after reading about the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, the ancient Sumerians, the ancient Babylonians, the ancient Africans, the ancient Chinese, the ancient American Indians, the ancient Eskimos, after reading about all of their stories, he concluded that they all had one giant secret that they had between them. <clears throat> but that secret was split up amongst all these different people all over the world. So what he wanted to do was compile all of that information together and put it in a book. It's about like this, and it's called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And what he tried to do was give a Reader's Digest condensed version of the fact that every religion in the world practiced one religion. Remember what I said last night, there's only two religions in the world. There's Bible Christianity, and then there's witchcraft. And every, every religion that Manly Hall studied was a form of witchcraft. Every one of them. So here's what Manly Hall said. The question may legitimately be propounded. If these ancient mystical institutions were of such great pith and moment, why is so little information now available concerning them and the arcana, the word arcana means secret, they claim to possess? The answer is simple enough. The mysteries were secret societies. Notice that he capitalized the M on mysteries. Because Manly Hall personified 
the mystery. He gave it a personhood. By binding their initiates to inviolable secrecy and avenging with death the portrayal of the sacred trust. Although these schools were the true inspiration of the various doctrines promulgated by the ancient philosophers, the fountainhead of those doctrines was never revealed to the profane. Furthermore, in the lapse of time, the teachings became so inextricably linked with the names of their disseminators that the actual but recondite source, the mysteries, came to be wholly ignored. In other words, the true mystery, the true secret, in his opinion, got lost because it, got, it fell into all these different religious hands and they all changed it into something that it really never was. And he tried to piece the puzzle back together again after it had been torn all to pieces. So, the reason why I believe that he capitalized M in mysteries was because this is who's behind it. Mystery, that's her name. Mystery. She's in charge of all secret societies, odd fellows, Rosicrucians, the Catholic mysteries. She's in charge of every single one of them and she loves drinking the blood of martyrs and saints. Why does she love drinking the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ? Why does she love drinking that? Kevin, why does she love drinking that? Has to do with something called adrenochrome, which makes her what? Drunk. Because Revelation 17 says she's drunk with the blood of the martyrs and the blood of the prophets. There's something to that adrenochrome thing. There is. That part, I see it plainly in the scriptures. Okay? Plainly. Now, uh, here is a tarot card called the judgment. What do you see here? You see an angel, and what is he doing? He's blowing a trumpet. And what are these people doing? They're rising up out of their caskets. So this being a tarot card, and tarot has nothing to do with Bible prophecy. So should I try to read tarot cards to understand Bible prophecy? No. I should try to read Bible prophecy to understand what those things really mean. And while there is coming a day when you and I are going to hear a trumpet and rise up into the air. There is also coming a day that during those same trumpets, like with the fifth trumpet, when the fifth trumpet sounds and those angels come up out of the pit and they sting everybody, does it transform everybody in the whole world? Yeah, it does. Because do you know what happens? When they're stung, they don't die for five months. They become temporarily immortal. And people die every day around this world. But for five months, everybody in the world is going to be temporarily transformed to immortals when those locusts with those scorpion tails come out and sting everybody in the world. Okay, now, Deuteronomy 28. I'm going to show you guys something that's going to blow your mind. Deuteronomy 28 is, I believe, a prophecy of when these angels, a nation, comes down from the heavens. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. And thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thine hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labor shall a nation which thou knowest not 
eat up. Now ask the question now, is there a nation anywhere in this world that we don't know about? National Geographic's pretty much discovered them all. So how can it be a nation that's already on this earth? It can't be. And thou shalt be the only oppressed and crushed alway. And then in verse 36 it says, The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou hast set over thee unto a nation which neither now thou nor thy fathers have known. And there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. And remember when I showed you this and I told you that what is it that transforms everybody for five months to where they're immortals? That it was the locust coming up at the sounding of the fifth trumpet? Well, notice this in Deuteronomy 28. All thy trees and the fruit of thy land shall what? The locust consume. And then it says this in verse 48. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of what? What was that fourth kingdom? Iron. Upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. And the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far. From where? From the end of the earth. In other words, beyond the edge of the earth. The atmospheric line that goes around the planet from beyond the end of the earth God's going to bring them from there and he said as swift as the eagle flieth and a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand a nation of fierce countenance what do these grays look like to you these gray aliens do they look like happy, nice people that you would love to be friends with? Everybody that's encountered them and seen them said it scared them literally almost out of their mind. And when they got on their ship, it was nothing but pure terror. A nation of fierce countenance which shall not regard the person of the old nor show favor to the young. He shall eat the fruit of thy cattle. There's your cattle mutilations. The fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed. Which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil. Or the increase of thy kind or the flocks of thy sheep until he have destroyed thee. I want you to focus on this. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. I have a video to play for you. A lady did a documentary. She was one of these wacko new age ladies. And she interviewed all these people that favored being abducted by these aliens, felt themselves as being drawn to these aliens and wanted these aliens to come down to this earth and make this world a better place. And I'm going to show you two of them who claimed that they could speak the language of the tongue thou shalt not understand. Let me show you that video. The next really important experience for me was I was awake and there was a real being in the room. And visceral, I could touch it, see it, feel it. And then it touched my forehead. My head cocked back and my, my mouth began to speak in a language I'd never spoken before. It's more of a tonal language where the information's encoded onto the, the frequencies, but to be decoded by your heart and not the brain. Can you say something in the language? I'll see what comes through. Okay. Sua set eleaka, e suluun tuk ewe. Elo am mana e sala am at elo, ala onkis su sum ma e tala. Elo lo tu kishesea, elo at sa o sare tam mana e ku. 
et coulé à te sous chassé et un mono tu qui a wa art et sous nous mo et ou et ou la art et ou la kit c'est ça et c'est ça la touche ça it doesn't exactly translate into english the key to this language is that it's not transmitting data verbally through the mind it's transmitting images through the voice and dolphins do the same thing dolphins can transmit pictures to each other of what they're seeing through sonar there have been times where i have spoken a language that is very representative of a particular civilization or a particular group of beings and when i would speak it they would be there on the other side listening and and sending back information can you give a message that you mm -hmm. feel is important in the star mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. That's even okay. better. All right, I'll try it, I'll try this, okay? Ora satakaya, no to te ataka inna satakatur, ikitata inna satututi, 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 one of the cases that um, was interesting to me was the mother wrote to me saying that her daughter had reacted to some of the star languages that I, she'd seen on YouTube. And the daughter said, but I can speak those languages too. And she said to her mother, I, you know, there's three of them, but one of them heals water. When I speak at water, I can purify the water. And the mother told me that the water actually tasted differently. The star language comprises codes that can be heard, spoken, but also a message that can be transcribed. These languages are the frequencies that are waking us up, which is another thing that many do after contact. They start to write these strange scripts, which they say come from where they're from. So what does this mean to you? So these symbols aren't words. They're not something you can pronounce. So you're not going to look at it and read it and come up with a, a verbal expression of it. These symbols are more circuitry. So if I wanted to share, I could visualize you and draw that symbol. By enacting that circuitry, I'm allowing myself to tap into the information that you're willing to share. This amazing ability Zach has also helps explain other examples of extraterrestrial communication we have seen throughout history. For centuries, messages from otherworldly civilizations have been found in ancient artifacts, relics, archaeological findings, and monuments. One of the most well-known are the crop circles, and particularly those of Wiltshire, England, which, just like the star language, seem to contain a symbolic code language. There's a very large variety of meanings of these crop circles that have been happening for decades now. In addition to the astronomical symbols that are shown in crop circles, there are many other things too. There were some crop circles that were showing a Celtic cross, the flower of life. They're executed in our fields in the dark of night Did you hear what the first young man said happened to him as a child? That the alien came into his room, took his finger and touched his forehead and transmitted into him the ability to speak in tongues. Does that sound like something that you've heard happen before? Where? Charismatic churches. 
You see, when I started, when God put me on the journey to study prophecy, 1997, I made up my mind I was going to learn doctrine too. And I was going to, I was going to know from God not from the church I went to, not from the Bible college I went to, but from God, whether or not I could speak or should speak in a language that no one knew and that I personally did not know. And I came to the conclusion that the Holy Spirit gives Knowledge, not mysteries, not secret words that cannot be known. That's what I learned from the scriptures. And I've had, I've had gentle talks with pastors in Kenya. I've had gentle talks with a pastor who follows our ministry when they do tongues in their church, they follow the order given in 1 Corinthians 14. And so I don't, I don't get into it with them. They use a King James. And as such, I don't get into it with them. But I've also been in the church where the women were... I've been in that church. And the Holy Ghost, this was years ago before I ever got into prophecy. The Holy Ghost said, Mike, you know that's not right. And the Holy Ghost quoted from 1 Corinthians 14, let your women remain silent in the churches. You see, if there was going to be tongues talking done, it was to be done by the men, one, then another, in order, and then possibly a third and that by course, in other words, one after another, after another, and then another man was to stand up and translate what all three of those said. Period. The end. And I knew what I heard in that church was unbiblical. And the Holy Ghost does not break the scriptures. The scriptures cannot be broken. So... So you remember I told you about uh, John D. last night who learned this angelic language? That's what you just heard. Now, uh, this is Tom DeLong. You know who Tom DeLong is? He's a rock star. Where are you? What's wrong with you people? All the kids know about him? I didn't know about him either. He was part of a rock group back in the 90s in the O's called to the, uh, Blink-182. If you want to, you can go home tonight and you can look up the lyrics to the songs that he sang and wrote. But I won't read them here. Because they're filthy. But I want you to notice what's on Tom DeLonge's guitar. What symbol is that that's actually Tom DeLong there with his Mason's apron on see he is a Freemason rock star Freemason has it on his guitars and so Tom DeLong after the band blink 182 broke up he formed a company called to the Stars Academy of Arts and Science. Now the name of the company is To the Stars because Tom DeLong, along with Jeff Bezos, um, who owns Tesla? Elon Musk. Elon Musk, and a bunch of other billionaires are bound and determined to figure out ways for us to get off of this planet so that we can go out and be part of the rest of the space civilizations just like you see on Star Trek. 
By the way, Gene Roddenberry was a Freemason. Seems to be a theme among Freemasons that the earth joins the world of the cosmos. In fact, Gene Roddenberry invented a character in Star Trek who was half human and half alien. Who was he? Spock. Okay. And so, To the Stars Academy hired the former senior intelligence CIA director of operations, the former deputy assistant secretary of defense for intelligence. He hired the former director uh, of the DOD, CIA, DIA funded research programs. He hired the former program director for advanced systems, Lockheed Martin. He hired the former director of ATIP, Luis, Luis Elizondo, all working together to reach out to those who are behind the unidentified aerial phenomenons in order to bring humanity to his next leap in evolution. And they call it a paradigm shifting global movement. And what that movement is, is the ability to get mankind off of this planet because a lot of the billionaires believe that something bad and very earth killing is going to happen to this planet. And are they right? Of course they are. So in their mind, they believe that if they can leave this earth, they can escape that judgment. One of the programs that To The Stars Academy was working on was Warp Drive. And I'm not talking about science fiction stuff. I'm talking about the, that he hired the smartest guys. Let me just tell you what I believe. He hired guys to be part of this company who actually knew that we already had captured space vehicles. He hired them. The company's kind of broken up now. It's not really doing very well. It wasn't, you know, wasn't going to last forever. But Tom DeLonge was part of that. He was fascinated with UFOs all of his life. And he finally got the money to hire the guys that he thought. And these guys, you know, they tell you once you work for the CIA, do you ever stop working for the CIA? You never stop working for the CIA. They didn't go to work for him. They used him to work for them, is what I think. But the idea is, we're talking men who are dead serious about us very soon, let's say in the next 50 years, of having the technology to not only get us off the earth, but out of the solar system and over into the next galaxy if we, if we need to. To put mankind on a different planet than the one he's on now. And why are they doing that? Sure it is. And does God, now all this you say, Mike, you're making that up, am I? Because Obadiah said, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest where? Among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. God already said, when you get up to the stars, I'm going to bring you back down. Then he said, though thou dig into hell, then shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to where? Heaven. Thence will I bring them down. Two witnesses now out of the Bible have just told me that mankind is going to succeed in building a ship that will take him to a different star system to escape 
the earth. Not just to Mars, but he said, among the stars, is what he said. Isaiah 5, 26. He will lift up an ensign to the nations from far and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed and the latchet of their shoes be broken, whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent. Their horses' hooves shall be counted like flint and their wheels like a what? What do we say? What we say about the wheels last night that they were actually alive because the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry it away safe and none shall deliver it. And in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold, darkness and sorrow and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. And see, there's even a tarot card called the chariot. And now that you understand that in the Bible, the chariots are actually living creatures, you can sort of understand a little bit about what this card is all about. You see, we have a chariot. Here's the wheels. See the, the curtains above the top of the chariot? What are those here? Stars. This chariot is able to fly among the stars. I won't get into the rest of it, it's too deep. But anyway, the chariot card in the sea. Here's what Manley Hall said about the chariot card. The seventh number major trump is called the chariot. It portrays a victorious warrior crowned and riding in a chariot. Drawn by black and white sphinxes or horses. The starry canopy of the chariot is upheld by four columns. This card signifies the exalted one. Guess who that is? It's the Antichrist. That's the Antichrist. Look, notice he wears a crown of stars. Uh, who rides in the chariot of creation. The vehicle of the solar energy being numbered seven reveals the arcane truth that the seven planets are the chariots of the solar power which rides victorious in their midst. The four columns supporting the canopy represents the four mighty ones, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places, who uphold the worlds represented by this star-strewn drapery. The figure carries the scepter of the solar energy and its shoulders are ornamented with lunar crescents, the urim and the thummim. The sphinxes drawing the chariot resent the secret and unknown power by which the victorious ruler is moved continuously through the various parts of the universe. See, it just told you that this chariot has the ability to go anywhere in the universe that it wants. Um, in certain tarot decks, the victor signifies the regenerated man. That's the new man spoken of. For the body of the chariot is a cubic stone. The man in armor is not standing in the chariot, but rising out of the cube, thus typifying the ascension of the three out of the four, turning some of this stuff you won't understand. So let me move on here. Isaiah 13, 3, I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones. Who are they? Those are his evil, angelic army men. For mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. They come from, notice where they come from, a far country from the end of heaven. So when the fourth kingdom invades in the last days, where do they come from? The Bible says they come from the end of heaven. They come from the cosmos, the space, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. So back to Matthew 24, the stars shall fall from heaven. That's who these are here. Um, oh, I know what I wanted to do with this. 
He shall sound his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. Now, the rapture seen in Matthew 25 is the wedding. It is, we're the bride. Christ is the bridegroom. Paul makes that clear in Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for it. Um, I'm trying to remember the rest of it. I had it memorized. And gave himself for it. Um, I guess I better look it up. Ephesians 5. You could help me and turn there for me and read it for me. For the husband is, verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be under their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even the, as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined into his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great what? What have we been talking about tonight? The mysteries. This is part of the mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. When Paul said, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's part of the mystery. When the husband, Christ, is joined to the bride, that's part of the mystery as well. So, watch this. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, which is what we just saw here in Ephesians 5. This is a great mystery. But I, but, but I speak of Christ and the church. Now the marriage has taken place and what happened to the door? The door was shut. So those who were foolish and didn't have oil in their lamps, did they get married? No. Because if Christ shuts the door, who's the only one who can open it back up? Christ. Period. Now here's why I bring this up. Because in the mystery, well, we have Psalm 19, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sun is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race and so on. Okay, so here's why I bring all this up, because part of the mystery, there's Ephesians 5, I had it in my notes. Part of the mystery is what's called the sacred Marriage. You have a tarot card called the lovers. And I want you to notice that you have a woman with red hair, red wings. Who do you think this woman is? Mystery Babylon the Great. She's the overseer of a great joining together of two lovers, a man and a woman. There is a song, what's the name of the group? Black Eyed Peas. Y'all listen to them? Black Eyed Peas? 
You have eaten black eyed peas. There's a song that they sang called Meet Me Halfway. And the video of the song has the guy singing from a planet way up in space. And the girl singing in the video is on the earth on a, on a like a tree stump. And she's garnished with flowers and leaves and everything. She's of this earth. And the song says, meet me halfway. And it's about them two, her on the earth, him in space, singing to one another and finally joining together halfway in the middle, somewhere in space, somewhere where they join together as husband and wife. Where's Christ going to meet us? In the air. He's not coming to the earth, is he? We're not going to be on the earth when we meet Christ, are we? You see, it's a reverse picture of the rapture. And it has to do with the space dude and the earth woman joining together. Do you understand what that means? The sixth numbered major trump is called Lamour, the lovers. There are two distinct forms of this terror. One shows a marriage ceremony in which a priest is uniting a youth and a maiden, Adam and Eve, no. In holy wedlock, sometimes a winged figure above transfixes the lovers with his dart. The second form of the card portrays a youth with a female figure on one side. One of these figures wears a golden crown and is winged. If he's winged, what is he? He's an angel. So, um, let's see. In his wing, while the others are tired and flowing robes of the something and on her head is a wrath of vine leaves she's from the earth he's from the heavens the maidens represent the twofold soul of man spiritual and animal the first is his guardian angel and the second is ever present demon the youth stands at the beginning of a mature life the parting of the ways where he must choose between virtue and vice the eternal and the temperable above and a holy light is the genius of fate his star mistaken for cupid by, by the uninformed if the youth chooses unwisely the arrow blindfolded fate will transfix him in the pseudo Egyptian tarot the arrow of the genius points directly to the figure of vice therefore signifying that the end of her path is destruction this card reminds man that the price of free will or more correctly the power of choice is responsibility but it's about an earth woman marrying a man with wings has that ever happened before yeah you're getting it now aren't you and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth the daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they did they took them as what the Bible didn't say it just took them and fornicated with them. It said it took them and married them as wives. Okay? The wives are going to represent all of mankind who willingly give themselves over to the angels who come down to this earth for a marriage ceremony. The angels joining with mankind. Remember, it's happened before, and Solomon said the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. This is a Mormon wedding ceremony. And in a Mormon wedding ceremony, the two participants wear their holy underwear. Stupidest thing in the world, right? But look at it. Look what's on the left and right breast of the holy underwear. 
The marks in the garments are sacred symbols. Thus, the V-shaped symbol on the left breast is referred to as the compasses. While the reverse L-shaped symbol on the right breast was referred to by early church leaders as the square. The square and the compass is what the Mormon marriage represents. You see, he represents the gods. In Mormon theology, what do they believe about every man? Exactly! That they're going to get their own planet and be a god. So what does it mean about every Mormon woman? That she gets to marry a god and have god children. It's the same secret. Same, because while, while uh, Brigham Young and Joseph Smith were stopped in Nauvoo, Illinois. They joined the Nauvoo, Illinois Masonic Lodge. And they learned all of the Masonic secrets and ceremonies. And then they inculcated all of those Masonic ceremonies and secrets into the Mormon church. And they're there to this Day. So what do these symbols mean? This symbol represents the heavens, the male. This symbol represents the earth, the female. What about this symbol? The heavens, the male, this symbol, the earth, the female. Married together. See, it is there. Manly Hall called it the indissoluble blending of divinity and humanity. And that's exactly right out of Daniel chapter 2, where they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. I'm telling you, it is the biggest thing that is going to happen since the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you it is. Manly Hall, symbolism is the language of the mysteries. In fact, it is the language not only of mysticism and philosophy, but of all of nature. For every law and power active in universal procedure is manifested to the limited sense perceptions of man through the medium of symbol. Every form existing in the diversified sphere of being is symbolic in the divine activity by which it is produced. By symbols, men have ever sought to communicate to each other these thoughts which transcend the intentions of language. Rejecting man-conceived dialects as inadequate. Remember what that young man said about the, the, the language that he spoke? That it cannot be spoken in words. And that's what they're saying there. That in a single figure, a symbol may both reveal and conceal, for to the wise, the subject of the symbol is obvious. While to the ignorant, the figure remains inscrutable. Hence, he who seeks to unveil the secret doctrine of antiquity must search for that doctrine, not open the pages of books which might fall into the hands of unworthy, but in the place where it was originally concealed. And I'm telling you, I did. I read... I read Manley Hall's uh, Secret Teachings of All Ages. I read uh, Fat Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. I read every Masonic book I could get my hands on. I, I read everything looking for them, where, what book they wrote their secret in and found out that they never wrote their secret down in any book ever. They wrote about symbols and they wrote about mysteries and they wrote about allegories and they wrote about stories and all of this stuff but they never one time wrote the symbol wrote the secret down i found the secret in the king james bible and then when i went back and reread those books i went oh i know everything that they're trying to hide now i know every secret that they have because i had the key 
right here in my hand to every secret that they tried to lock up. Uh, let's see here. Let me move on. It is the ancient symbols of Freemasonry that its real secrets lie concealed. And these as densely veiled to the Mason as to any other, unless he studied the science of symbolism in general and Masonic symbols in particular. The most profound secrets of Masonry are not revealed in the lodge at all. They belong only to the few. In other words, if you know somebody who goes to the Masonic lodge, not even he knows their secrets. Because they lied to him. They're not going to tell him the secret. Why? Because he may quit the lodge and then go out and tell everybody else what their real secret is. They're not going to tell anybody. There's very few people, very few people in this world, I believe, actually know what all of this is about. Um, let me get to something here. Yeah, let me get to this. The square is a right angle formed by two right lines. It is adapted only to a plane surface and belongs only to geometry or earth measurement. That trigonometry which deals only with planes and with the earth, which the ancients supposed to be a plane. In other words, the, the ancient people believed the earth was flat, a plane. The compass describes circles and deals with spherical trigonometry, the science of the spheres and heavens. So the former, therefore, is an emblem of what concerns the earth and the body. The latter of what concerns the heavens and the soul. Yet the compass is also used in plane trigonometry as in erecting perpendiculars. And therefore you are reminded that although in this degree both points of the compass are under the square, you are now dealing with only the moral and political meaning of the symbols and not with their philosophical and spiritual meanings. Still the divine ever mingles with, look here, still the divine ever mingles with the human with the earthly the spiritual intermixes now you understand what that means don't you it means that when those angels are kicked out of heaven what are they going to do when they get here mingle themselves with the seed of men and that's what every Masonic symbol stands for. Uh, the square is an instrument adapted for, we already read that. How about this one? This is one of my favorite symbols. This is supposed to be Solomon's temple. Notice that they have a, a, a crooked Staircase, a winding staircase. What does that look like to you? DNA. And I, you can go. I, I went to the Mother Lodge in Washington, D.C. And they, I didn't think I could be able to get in there. They take you on a tour and show you every, they show you everything in that place. They took us into the big lodge room where all the high-ranking masons have their meetings. And we came to a set of two staircases that winded around. And I knew, I thought, okay, I think I know what those are. And as the tour guide was leading us up, I started walking up steps and I was going, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I got to the top step and I went, 23. And I looked over and I saw a similar staircase on the other side and I went 23 and 23. What does that make? 46, the number of chromosomes in the human body. And I went, oh. But here's something interesting. They have a replica of the two pillars in Solomon's temple, Jachin and Boaz. Remember Jachin? Jachin and Boaz. Jachin was 23 cubits tall. Boaz was 23 cubits tall. 46 cubits total. Because it represented the human chromosomes. 
But when masons make their two columns, there's a globe on top of each one. And always, always in every Masonic temple with Jacob and Boaz, one globe is the earth, and one globe is the stars. Meaning, the joining of the 23 on this side and the 23 on that side, joining together to make a new man. Remember and turn to Genesis, turn to Genesis um, 2. Turn to Genesis 2. Let's, let's count. In verse 23, which I think is pretty cool. And Adam said, and then after the word said, I want you to count all the words that he said all the way down to the end of verse 24. I want you to count every word that Adam said after it says, and Adam said. What'd you get? Did everybody get 46? And isn't that neat? Because of what it says is, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave, and we know what that is, don't we? Shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. And in, in the conception process, the husband donates 23 chromosomes and the wife donates 23 chromosomes and they mix together to make the 46 chromosomes of a brand new human being. Isn't that amazing about your King James Bible? So, when 23 from this column, the earth, Mate with 23 from this column, the stars. What are they going to make? A new species. A new man. And I believe that that new man is the man of sin. The son of perdition that's who I believe he is and I believe that he is going to cause the transformation of every human being left on this planet and it won't be us amen I'm going to, I'm going to close with something and it's going to be a reminder to you turn to Mark Those of you worried about genetically modified foods. Those of you worried about pharmaceutical companies. Those of you worried about doctors going crazy. Let me remind you of something that Jesus said, if I can find it. Oh, let's see here. Yeah. M Mark chapter 16, which incidentally is usually removed out of most modern translations. This part that I'm going to read to you. Let's start at verse 16. Because verse 16 through 20 is gone. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptized meaning baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up what? Not on purpose, I guarantee you. I won't touch a serpent ever on purpose. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Do you believe that? They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Mm. There's even a passage, I can't remember where it is, if you can find it, let me know, where Jesus said, I will give you power to tread upon scorpions and serpents. Remember that verse? And what is it that's coming out of the pit in Revelation 9? Scorpions. That's what's coming out. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you power to tread on them so that they can't hurt you. Let me convince you of something. Please. If you're truly born again, God is not going to let you receive the mark of the beast. Period. Now, if you're just faking it, you're in trouble. You see, I'm not even by his judge. I can't tell you, John. I can't tell you. I can't tell you. I can't tell your bird. I can't tell anybody whether you're truly saved or not. I've been fooled. I've been fooled by people. Since I've been pastoring Bethel since 1996, you'd be surprised at the type and number of people that I've been fooled by who led me to believe they were true Christians who right now are living in absolute depravity. But if you're truly born again, should you ever have to worry about getting the mark of the beast? Never. God simply won't let you do it. Because it's not for you. It's for those. It's, it's the, the very first verse that we, that we looked at. Remember the angels are made of flaming fire. And in 1 Thessalonians 1, God said he was going to come in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon those who believe not. And I believe that flaming fire is those angels that are going to come down. And that mark is coming with them. That's why I don't believe it's here now. And it won't be until they come.